Hi, and welcome to Snake Therapy. I'm Shira, and this is Anu, the Mexican Black King Snake. We're back with part two of the Snake Intelligence series today. If you haven't seen the first installment, definitely check that out because it'll lay the foundation for what we discussed in today's follow-up episode. Last time, we looked at the reptilian brain theory and its trickle-down effect on our understanding of the capacity of snakes to be intelligent and how, although it's widely believed that snakes and other reptiles aren't smart, they've actually shown behavior that falls well within our definitions of intelligence. Today, though, we're going to take a further, deeper dive by exploring the two remaining quotients of intelligence categorization, which includes the processing of emotions, a hot topic considering that most people assume reptiles aren't capable of emotions at all. But is that really true? What do we actually know about that and what do we assume? We'll also go over a widely propagated list of most intelligent snake species and find out why they've received the honor and whether that list makes any sense at all. To find out, let's slither on into part two. If you recall, the psychology field categorizes intelligence into four quotients. IQ, or intelligence quotient, SQ, or social quotient, AQ, or adversity quotient, and EQ, or emotional quotient. Last time we focused on IQ and SQ, and today we're going to focus on AQ and EQ, and examine what we have and have not yet observed in snakes, that illustrates how they might actually have more smarts and possibly even feelings than most people think. The adversity quotient refers to one's ability to overcome challenges or adversity without falling into despair and giving up. Now, if you're of the mind that snakes can't feel despair and therefore the comparison to adversity here is compromised, just stick with me until the next section before you write this off. Is it not significant that snakes have been symbols of resilience across many cultures for millennia, attributed to their skills of adaptation, change, and thriving against adversity? For specific examples, though, snakes posed with adversity such as restriction of space, movement, or poor environmental conditions will try to find ways to escape. They can even learn to manipulate latches and sliding doors. When stuck in adverse circumstances, you might see them constantly exploring the boundaries of their confinement, seeking a way out. Remember, most people say that snakes act purely on instinct. Instinct is an innate genetic disposition to act in certain ways, whereas intelligence refers to learned behaviors based on novel stimuli. I'd say that latches and sliding doors are novel stimuli, wouldn't you? So is this example instinct or intelligence? What do you think? In our last episode, we discussed how adaptable snakes are, which could easily be a tick under the adversity quotient box. Snakes faced with environmental adversity in the wild, such as climate change, loss of habitat, and the subsequent reduction of prey items will adapt. Seeking out new home territories, utilizing whatever structures are available to them for shelter, even if not natural to them, and they can go months without food and still survive. When faced with a possible predatory threat, snakes will use warning signals, such as rattling tails or puffing themselves up to look scary. Is that purely instinct or also an example of AQ? And now we're going to go where most refuse to when it comes to reptiles, emotions. EQ, or the Emotional Intelligence Quotient, refers to the managing and communication of emotions. I'd say that 95% of people think that snakes don't have the capacity for emotion at all, including people who love and keep and study them. So first, let's talk about why that is. If you recall, the triune brain theory posited that the reptilian brain is composed of parts that exclusively function for instinctual and impulsive actions. According to some studies I read, love or affection are not emotions that naturally benefit snakes, so therefore they can't feel them. The problem with this theory is that the actual reptile brain, not the reptilian brain coined by McLean, 
include the amygdala, which is responsible for producing emotions, and the hippocampus, which is responsible for regulating emotions. And their brains likewise produce the same neurochemicals such as dopamine and serotonin that we attribute to producing emotions like pleasure and happiness. Fundamentally, we as humans categorize and label everything based on what we experience and perceive as feelings of love and happiness, etc. And likewise, what we understand as communicated expressions of those emotions. But just because emotional response in reptiles is not analogous to humans or other mammals is not irrefutable proof that they can't feel those emotions at all. I think it's more likely that they just are felt and communicated differently. It's only in recent years that there's been any research done on this subject, and it's still extremely lacking in thoroughness. A study that examined hundreds of research papers published between 1990 and 2019 about the emotions of animals showed only a total of 50 species of reptiles were featured, which adds up to less than 1% of the more than 10,000 known species of reptiles on the planet. Several articles pointed out that the sheer lack of consideration for reptiles by humans meant that the topic was poorly represented in scientific studies on the whole. If we haven't prioritized even trying to figure out if or what they feel, or whether they might have unique expressions of their emotions, then I would argue that it's more probable that they do have feelings, we just don't fully understand them. There's definitely stigma against anthropomorphizing snakes, but there are different types of anthropomorphism and not all are negative. A review on the scientific literature for evidence of reptile sentience noted this specifically, saying, uncritical anthropomorphism is unhelpful and can be damaging as animals' behaviors and needs can be misunderstood, which risks weakening the scientific field of sentience. Critical anthropomorphism, however, effectively uses our innate intuitions and empathy along with the objective evidence and an understanding of an individual animal and their species to draw conclusions regarding sentience to steer research initiatives. It's that uncritical anthropomorphism that leads us to assume and prioritize the study of emotions of mammals over reptiles because we're able to find more similarities to ourselves in mammals. This article pointed to a handful of papers that successfully showed evidence for the capacity of reptiles to feel things like pleasure and anxiety. And yet only one of those studies used snakes as test subjects, favoring lizards or tortoises instead. And why do you think that is? Because most people have negative bias towards snakes, of course. And this bias means their sentience is not widely accepted. Such an attitude obviously has negative implications for how we treat them overall. The positive anthropomorphism that allows us to tap into empathy, if disregarded, can lead us to cause suffering to both wild and captive snakes. Likewise, anthropomorphic assumptions based only on the feelings we recognize in ourselves can also cause suffering. Reptophiles has a great article about this. I'll put a link to it in the description below. But one of her examples is someone saying, I know the recommended temperature is X, but I feel like that's just way too hot, so I lowered it. Just because the person feels like the temps are too hot does not mean the animal does. They literally evolved to prefer those conditions. Most of the scientific studies I read on reptile emotional capacity seem focused solely on the experience of negative states like pain and fear and anxiety. But there are a few that showed play behavior in reptiles, and even, in snakes specifically, preference for flavors, suggesting that they could very well feel types of pleasure. Studies about reptiles preferring one human over another usually suggest that it's due to their familiarity and association of safety with a person, as opposed to affection. But Definitive statements I came across like these really just got under my skin. Snakes do not possess the intellectual capacity to feel affection for their owners. I can attest to the concept that snakes don't display behavior that looks like loyalty as does a dog. 
But just because Anu doesn't follow me around like my pup Ume here, doesn't unequivocally mean she doesn't or can't feel affection at all. Couldn't it just as easily be that they are feeling and or communicating it in a way we haven't yet figured out how to detect? Their version of love, whether for each other or for their keepers, just might not be the same as what our love is. Scientifically speaking, we just don't know. Oh, you're real cute. Not only do my snakes recognize me, but they exhibit behaviors suggesting they're interested in my touch or even that they feel pleasure when touched. Many of my snakes will stop moving, relax their muscles, lean into my finger, or even lift their heads a little so I have more access when I rub their chins. Even my blue tongue skink calms her normally skittish behavior when I do this to her. That seems like a pretty clear indicator that they can at least feel pleasure if not some sense of contentment and happiness. Most of my snakes will extend their heads to my face and rub against it during handling sessions. Yeah. Yeah, you're giving me some nuzzles. Thank you. A behavior suggesting curiosity, recognition, and dare I say, affection? Yet according to many scientists and even veterinarians, the primary emotions that snakes and other reptiles feel are fear and aggression. And well, you all know how I feel about using the word aggression in conjunction with snakes. The number one most common myth about snakes is that they are aggressive. Remember, this is not aggression. Snakes are not aggressive, but they can be defensive. Snakes don't seek to harm humans. Overly defensive behavior. This is defense, not aggression. I repeat, snakes are not aggressive. Furthermore, if snakes had zero emotional intelligence, then they wouldn't display learned helplessness, which they absolutely can do. Learned helplessness is the behavior exhibited by a subject after enduring repeated aversive stimuli beyond their control, often followed by depression and lethargy and the loss of will to avoid adversity. Now we already know that snakes will try to avoid adversity, but it's also been shown that if snakes face adversity for long enough, they can eventually come to the conclusion that they're trapped and display lethargy akin to depression quitting the expression of their natural species typical behaviors, even refusing to eat. Without some kind of emotional intelligence, this wouldn't occur. They would just keep trying to conquer that adversity until they died. Ironically, even though it's loudly proclaimed that snakes are not smart, I found many websites containing a list of most intelligent snakes ranked by species, and almost all of them were the same. Number one, king cobras. They manipulate their environment, are keenly aware of their surroundings, have acute eyesight, and are well known to recognize humans that work with them. Definitely check out Chris Sweet's channel if you want to learn more about how incredible those snakes are. He rescues, raises, and free handles them. But of course, don't try that yourself unless you've written a will and your casket is picked up. Number two, rattlesnakes. They exhibit social behaviors, hunting strategies, learned behaviors, create nests for, and care for their young. Number three, reticulated pythons who are reported to be extremely curious, have excellent memory, recognition, and personalities. Number four, boa constrictor emperators. Well, I didn't find much cited evidence to back this one up, but I had a BCI that seemed pretty damn smart to me. Number five, corn snakes. Reports of complex problem-solving abilities and response to training. Although this one seemed to be contested on forums. Number six, Burmese pythons, who are obviously amazing at adapting to new environments, but have also been trained to press a button in order to receive a food reward. Number seven, Cuban boas. 
who are known to use teamwork by hunting in groups. And number eight, black mambas. This one seemed to have a lack of evidence as well, as the reports of their intelligence seemed to focus on stories of their defensive behavior when pitted against human presence or interference with their habitats, which I guess you could say is AQ. The internet being the internet, I found more opinion and anecdotal material than anything else regarding why these species rank at the top. But I also want to point out that although certain species may seem to display more human-centric, recognizable intelligence, I don't think we can actually judge snakes' intelligence wholly based on species. Firstly, there are over 3,000 species of snakes, and we simply haven't studied them enough. Period. Secondly, snakes are individuals, just like humans and other mammals. I think we can agree that not all humans are smart. All animals are individuals and intelligence can show itself in many ways. For example, Severus, my boa constrictor and broader, one of those top ranking species, spent almost the entire first year of his life in a dark drawer without enrichment and little to no social interaction. And it seems to me this lack of stimulation caused his cognitive abilities to be slow to develop. Since coming into my care, however, his behavior and personality have changed, and he's starting to exhibit more signs of intelligence. This further reinforces my belief in the importance of providing enrichment and stimuli to snakes from an early age. Anu here seems to show quite a bit of observable intelligence, and yet king snakes aren't on that most intelligent snakes list anywhere. In fact, I've read a multitude of accounts of how dumb they are, like trying to eat their own tails or things that aren't food items, for example. And then there's my other king snake, Hobbs. And well, he hasn't tried to eat himself or anything, but he seems to show the least intelligence of my snakes. He's really cute though. My conclusion is that we as humans default too quickly to definitive answers without fully accounting for factors that are beyond our cognizance or experience, which really speaks more about our intelligence than anything else. Without a lot more and better developed research, I don't think we can fully and truly know how intelligent snakes are, let alone what they think or feel. We simply haven't spent enough time and energy prioritizing and exploring the subject. But that being said, Broad statements like snakes aren't intelligent, they only act on instinct, seem easily disproved by the evidence we've reviewed over the course of the last two episodes. What do you think? Please take a moment to hit that like button if you enjoyed this, it really helps us out. And thank you for caring enough to explore with me. Hop over to the Patreon page and join the community. Members receive ad-free and extra content some special gifts, and of course my eternal gratitude. The more we learn, the greater we can expand our capacity for empathy for snakes and all living things. I'm Shira, and this is Anu, and we'll see you next time for more snake therapy.